Yeah. All right. So we're recording now. This is Dr. Miguel Damask. How you doing, buddy? Uh, I'm very fine. And you, John? I'm doing well. Uh, last week's response was overwhelming, and I was really pleased with it. Miguel, today we'll be talking about PTH, parathyroid hormone, and vitamin D, and yeah. how we measure those and uh, how those uh, relate to the Coimbra protocol. So with any further ado, here is Miguel Domas. Yes. To talk about yeah, because, I mean, uh, the responses that we get in the questions that were submitted, well, they were quite um, widespread in terms of, of, of topic, but there was kind of a trend to talk about vitamin D and usually people get a little bit worried mm -hmm. about why vitamin D is so high and it's toxic and also what is PTH and why does it matter in terms of the protocol? So what I decided to, to, to do today is to address these two questions by explaining basically what they are, why they are important, and make sure that we can um, get in on the same page. So what I'll do is draw with my trusted uh, pencil and explain like just like I do on my appointments with any of my patients. So uh, all of my patients will probably recognize this, but I think it's important to create some ground rules and ground uh, knowledge in terms of uh, the, the explanation on the Quino protocol. So let's start with uh, vitamin D and why uh, does, do we need vitamin D? And the question, the answer is quite simple. We need vitamin D to be high in order to maximize its biological effect. So now, when you say high, can you clarify that a little bit? I, yes, I can clarify, it's really high. I mean, there's no ceiling on vitamin D, um, on, on, on much, how much we need. I, I've seen a patient of mine with 6,000 in the blood, which is significantly wow. high. So for all of you that are already concerned about toxic levels and toxicity and the kidneys, we'll get into that just in, in, in a bit. But before, why do we need so, so high uh, vitamin D? It's just like I was saying, we need it to maximize the biological effect. What we know is that vitamin D to make its real effect, um, and for you just to get an idea on how broad the, 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 the power of vitamin D is, uh, there is probably no system, no biological system in our, in our uh, body that can survive or can function well without vitamin D. So vitamin D works, in, especially in the nucleus. It optimizes the genetical transcription of the DNA. And depending on the paper that you read, some, we can, the, the, most, the, the biggest impact that I've read is 25% of the whole DNA in every cell needs vitamin D to be correctly read. So we can extrapolate the possible impact of vitamin D in, in the body. So, to, in order for the vitamin D to really be effective, we have to, to connect a three-piece machine, which is the, the 1,25-dehydroxy vitamin D3, which is the active vitamin D or calcitriol, that's the technical name. It has to connect to the VDR, and that's the vitamin D receptor. And it also has to connect to retinal X receptor. So this is a receptor of vitamin A. It, there's no much, that much importance of, of this, but just to be scientifically correct, here it is. So only when these three pieces of the puzzle connect very well together, we have the vitamin D doing what it's supposed to do. Now, what has been studied and actually, a paper here from uh, the University of Porto, where I, where I studied, it was published, I think it's two years ago, three years ago. It stated that more than 20, there were more than 20 places throughout the metabolism of vitamin D that could have what it's called as an SNP. An SNP stands for single nucleotide polymorphism. And what it is, these are very, very tiny genetical mutations, very tiny uh, changes in the, in the genome 
that will code for a different uh, a difference in the proteins or the receptors or the enzymes that are being coded in that part of the DNA. So it is not enough to create a catastrophic uh, mutation, but it's enough to create changes. And the most study SNP or SNP uh, in the whole vitamin D metabolism is in the gene that's called VDR. That's the gene that codes for vitamin D receptor. And these changes, what they will lead into are 3D configurational changes of the VDR. So basically what it means is that this connection between the vitamin D, the active vitamin D and the receptor will not be able to be done correctly or optimally. So what this creates, it's a resistance to the biological effect of vitamin D. So that's what the basis that we have or that we've been um, showing to be the, um, the whole um, basis of autoimmunity, if you want, especially MS, that's what's been most studied. So having these single nucle nucleotide polymorphisms in any of those 20 plus places, especially in the VDR, will create this resistance. Like It's like a dam in a river. So what Professor Quimber started to understand and, and to develop was a way to optimize this um, effect and to make sure that we could overcome the resistance that was created by the genes. And that's where the high dosage of vitamin D comes from. Because when we get you, get you or anyone on the protocol with high dosages, what we want is to make sure that the active, in this case, the active part, form of vitamin D will connect efficiently and correctly to the receptor in order for the whole machinery to work and the genetic transcription gets um, gets on its way and, and will be done properly. So Can that I is why interrupt you one minute and throw yes, something sure. in here. All right. In layman's terms, I've always heard uh, this that some people, because of their genes, genetic uh, disposition, or I guess you'd say, mm -hmm. they do not absorb vitamin D. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They have done studies on lifeguards in California where they sit out in the sun for two hours and one group uh, received 20,000 international units of vitamin D from the sun, but the other group only received 10. Mm -hmm. Now they said the reason behind that is because one group of people is gen genetically uh, predisposed to absorbing vitamin D. Mm -hmm. So what you're describing here is how is is people not being able to absorb vitamin D uh, and convert well, it? Yeah, so um, the whole metabolism of vitamin D starts either in the skin or in the intestine. So the skin through the UVB radiation, um, a, com um, a compound called 7-hydroxy uh, cholesterol will be uh, changed and we'll start the, the whole uh, metabolism of vitamin D and that same com component can be, um, uh, the, it's the cholecalciferol can be absorbed uh, through the gut. So then it will go into the, the liver to be activated. And then the second activation will be inside the cells. In between you will have trans um, like carriers um, and in uh, any of these steps, you can have these SNPs and you can have a genetically um, deficiency or uh, impairment in the process. So in the case that you, that you were talking, you may have a difficulty in producing the active part of vitamin D. Some people may have a problem in the absorption of vitamin D in the gut. Other people may have a problem in the, the carrier, so they cannot carry that much vitamin D around. So at the end of the day, it's the same. It's the same resistance that we are dealing here uh, with here. And of overcoming it is the goal. And that's what we do with high vitamin D. 
So that's why we need high dosage of vitamin D is to try to get this right. This connection so in order for three, these to work. There are three ways we can get vitamin D, the sun, supplements or our food, correct? Yeah, correct, yeah, correct. Okay. Even though the foods is, uh, I would say theoretical. I mean, there are vitamin foods with vitamin D, out of curiosity, if you put mushrooms or if you expose mushrooms to the sun, they will get more vitamin D rather than if you just eat mushrooms without sun exposure. So, but it, the amount of vitamin D that you can have from food, uh, especially in the context of autoimmunity and what we need to, to, to make sure that we uh, optimize our immune system is very small, is very small. So, now, going back to the question that you asked is how much vitamin D do we need and how high is high? And it is a very big question mark. I don't know. We don't know from the get-go. So that's why we need to talk about balance. That's balance that involves calcium. And anyone on the protocol knows that calcium is a big part of it. Um, today we will talk, well, we can talk about but both the, the good and the bad side of, of calcium. Uh, but let's start from the good side. Um, the calcium is very important in the protocol because that's the only way we have to measure what is the real biological effect that vitamin D is doing. And it, 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 worked, it, it is very straightforward because we need to have a very controlled level of calcium in the blood because too much calcium will get you some sort of problems, but also too little calcium will get you some sort of problems. And um, as you can, anyone can see in their reports, in analytical report, the reference range of calcium is always very small. That's why we need to have uh, a very small reference of calcium because if, you, if we go too much on each, each direction, we will create a problem. So in order to have this calcium in the blood under control, we basically need a balance between what's entering from the gut into the blood, but also what we are releasing from the bones into the blood. So between what's entering from the outside and what we are picking up from our storage and the bones are our uh, main storage of calcium, we can maintain the calcium in the blood under control. So how do these how, how, does, how does it work? And it works in a very old fashioned way, like one of those old scales that we used to have with two dishes. And that's just like that. When this side, um, so this side of the, 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 of the scale is controlled by vitamin D. So vitamin D will make sure that your calcium enters from the gut to the blood. On the other side, what we have is PTH or parathermone. That's our second friend that we'll also discuss today. So because it works inversely, when the biological effect of vitamin D is low, PTH is high. When the biological effect of vitamin D starts to go up, this goes down. So if we want to have the maximum biological effect of vitamin D, we need to have the minimum PTH. And this is how we control everything in the protocol. That's why we need high doses of vitamin D because we need this to be very high in order to make sure that we optimize all the genetical, uh, sorry, all the physiological pathways that may be uh, impaired by genetical uh, polymorphisms. And we, as we measure it by having this on the low side. Because I had, through my experience with, with patients, I've been able to achieve it with uh, op like the optimum balance with patients taking 40,000 units of vitamin D and some people need 400,000 units. 
So that this will can lead to um, a reference and a, a concentration of vitamin D, a level of vitamin D in the blood of 120, 140. I have I have seen 6,000. So we don't know the amount. We just know where we want the PTH at. Exactly, because the PTH will measure the downstream effect. The whole uh, path, the, the whole steps of of the metabolism combined, the PTH will measure the downstream effect. So it we should, measure. It, sorry. Oh, I was just saying that it shows us how much vitamin D then is being absorbed into the bloodstream. So even the mm -hmm. vitamin D level might be high. If the PTH is not moving down, the vitamin D is not being absorbed. Is that correct? Well, it can be absorbed, but may not be activated, or it can be activated and may not be transported. It may be, be moved around. It may not be connecting to the receptor. There's a, a lot of different steps. So imagine that the vitamin D goes way up. However, the PTH stays the same. Well, it just means that the bell, the, the scale is not working properly, right? So that's why we need to push this even further until this goes down. So that's why we need high doses of vitamin D. And actually, it doesn't matter that much, the actual value of vitamin D that, that, that you have. I do measure it in my patients to make sure that they are absorbing vitamin D and that they are not destroying vitamin D over time. But I never change anything in the treatment because of vitamin D itself, okay? It's always because of the balance and I always look into PTH. So that leads into the second question that we have is how low can uh, PTH go? and whether or not it's harmful. And uh, yes, the short answer is yes. PTH, when it is too low, it is harmful. So um, the, the job of PTH is just to it's basically balancing the calcium in our, in our body. That's basically it. So there's not that much of other effects that it has. So, what we want is a PTH to be low enough because it means that vitamin D is very effective without getting too low. So in the world, we have basically two reference ranges of vitamin of PTH. We have the most common one, which is 15 to 65 or 1.7 to 8 point something. This, this value it varies uh, quite a lot. But basically what we want is PTH to be here. In the first case, it should be higher than five and here it should be higher than 0 0.5. So when PTH reaches, let's put here in this color, color, this space lower than reference range, but higher than this five or 0 0.5, it, show, it is where we want because, it, as I was saying, it's, uh, it is telling us that vitamin D is very effective without being too, uh, too dangerous or we are creating issues. Lower than this, it can, here, it can create issues. It can create, it can, um, it, it will change the balance of calcium in the system. Um, so it can get too low and I have patients that, um, that it went too low. Uh, so what we did was adjust the vitamin D dosage and lower the vitamin D a little bit. A common question on that I get and on Facebook is people want to know what their PTH should be, uh, you know, because it'll come back and it'll be 13 or 14. And I often tell them we don't have a number. Dr. Coimbra says that your PTH should be towards the lower limit. So if let's say your lower limit is 12, then we, we shoot for that. But the, uh, the, the object is to stop disease progression. And we don't know that if you go to 12, that your progression is gonna stop. Uh, is that co correct? 
Well, yeah, oh, yeah, yes, it is correct to a point. I mean, we we cannot. Uh, I I cannot uh, promise. I don't promise any results to my patients because there's so much that we still don't know about um, autoimmunity. Sure. Um, but what we what we can say is when PTH is here, let's say around 10, it means that vitamin D is probably very effective, if not full effective. So it means that in terms of the, the whole immune optimization and the whole uh, immune responses development and cell development, it should be optimized. So therefore um, the, 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 the molecular molecular uh, a signature of autoimmunity should be turned off should but it may be on but we should always aim for this that's what my aim is with my patients usually now it's always try to go here it means that vitamin d is on the perfect uh, perfect uh, effect if you want um, and we are being able to overcome all the genetic resistances that may exist uh, throughout the, the pathways um, in order to maximize uh, uh, genetic transcription and optimize uh, cell function. So yeah, so this is um, the, the PTH, the role of PTH protocol is quite quite massive. Actually, it's one of the only, it's one of the main markers that we need to measure because that's the only way we have to assess if vitamin D is effective or, 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 or not. So um, yeah, let me go back to a little bit on the vitamin D because one of the questions that we received was, or that I, well, I also received them from my patients quite often is, um, they do the blood analysis and they receive a phone call from the lab saying, you are almost dying, your PTH is through the roof. You should see, you should go to the hospital, should be admitted, you are uh, on the, the verge of collapse. And, um, and I understand it. The labs are doing the right thing, warning patients. But I also want to tell you um, and to anyone that, uh, that is watching this video, uh, why they should, what they should look for and why they should not be harmed about the vitamin D. Can I interject so, one, one thing yes, there? Please. I often tell people that ask me, they have trouble getting a hold of their doctor. So they'll, let's say they come back and their vitamin D is 130. Their lab has told them, oh my goodness, you're on the point of death. You need to go see a specialist, you know. Uh, I often tell people when your protocol doctor gets excited and emails you back immediately, then it's time for you to get excited. But if you don't hear back from, from them, uh, they're yeah, probably that's... busy and it's not a big deal. They see it thousands of times. And if they're not excited, don't you get excited. I yeah, remember one time I emailed problem, yeah. you about something and my doctor was flipping out. He said I was in renal failure. Uh, you didn't even text me back and uh, not for about a week or so. And I, I didn't get excited because I knew that if you got excited, then I'd get excited. But typically, uh, what I've experienced, and I've had more than one protocol doctor, is there's, it's typical. You know, what you're going through is typical, but it may not be what your doctor is seeing. So to him, it might not be typical, and he might do, be, do exactly what he would do with thousands of other patients, and that is to warn them uh, that something's wrong when they're in actuality. Uh, nothing yeah yeah so that, that's that's a fair point yeah. over the years i i and because of the the amount of patients and amount of daily emails that i get i uh, i've been tweaking my uh, almost the rules of engagement um and my patients know that if they email me something that is serious in probably less than 24 hours 
usually within the same day, I reply. So if yes. they don't receive a reply over 24 hours, it's probably nothing serious. I, eventually I reply, but um, uh, but yeah, so that's that's a good a, a good observation. We we all, as far as I know, we all re have uh, quite a, lo a lot amount of, of success and myself being one of the most experienced uh, in the world have I, I do have a lot of of a patient of patients that I need to 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 get in touch with. So it gets hard. So anyone that any patient of mine that sends me an analysis or something as like symptoms or or whatever it, it may be, if I don't reply in twenty four hours, they know they can be um, they can rest assured that everything should be fine, and I reply eventually. Yeah. I whether so, it's you or another doctor, I tell people that doctors typically what I've experienced is they read all their emails and then they respond to the things that need to be responded yeah. to but if it doesn't um, they've got other things they need to attend yeah to. that's that that's that yeah that's pretty much it so going back to vitamin D and the toxic so um, let's let's get just one argument out of the way and the argument is, or the statement that I want to make is there is virtually zero evidence that vitamin D itself creates any problem in the body. Virtually zero evidence. What happens is when, sorry, oh, I don't know what happened here. When we have high vitamin D in the system, what will happen is all the calcium that gets into the gut that we eat, that we drink one way or the other will be absorbed to the blood. The problem is that our kidneys cannot cope with that amount of calcium. They just cannot open their doors like the gut can. So if nothing is done, when we have high dosage of vitamin D, it will lead into problems, kidney problems, like kidney calcification. It's not kidney stones, it's kidney calcification, technically it's called nephrocalcinosis, that will lead to kidney uh, impairment, kidney failure, and then the whole body goes into a big shutdown as well. But it is a very big distinction to make. It's not vitamin D that will create the problem. It's the calcium. It doesn't matter how much vitamin D you have in here. You can, ha you can have two kilos, literally 10 kilos of vitamin D in your blood. If your calcium is not raising, if your calcium is normal, everything is fine. At least from the, 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 the standpoint of calcium. And therefore, uh, the most serious side effects that are possible of the vitamin D. So whenever anyone Googles hypercalcemia, which is the technical name of, of uh, too much calcium in the blood, you'll have a full list of awful things. But usually the, same se the first sentence is high vitamin D can create hypercalcemia. That creates this. So that's why in the protocol, we need to, to follow very strict guidelines in terms of diet, in terms of hydration to make sure that one we don't have too much calcium going in two we have a lot of calcium going out like we clean the kidneys obviously it doesn't happen like that but we reduce the concentration of calcium in the kidneys so therefore we don't uh, allow nephrocalcification to 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 take place so that's why when you have toxic, toxic levels of vitamin D, it doesn't mean that you're toxic. It means that you can be toxic if your calcium go high. If your calcium don't go high, you're not toxic. Or you're not having hypercalcemia. You may have other issues, but not uh, hypercalcemia, therefore not harmful, and uh, there should not be any big issue. When your PTH is low, it means that vitamin D is very 
active, is doing what it's supposed to do. So it's a good sign. It's always a good sign, always. And any adjustment on the vitamin D is always based on the PTH uh, variations and in order to achieve the goal of uh, getting the PTH right. Okay, let me interject something. Um, okay, let's say your PTH goes from 40 down to 20 and you're on 100,000 IU of vitamin D. Now, I've always been told that as you incrementally increase the vitamin D, that let's say 100,000 cause you to go down 20 that if you do another 100,000, you may only go down five. Uh, is that typically the case or is that on a case-by-case well, case basis? Yeah, it's a it's a case-by-case case, uh, situation, especially the longer you are on the protocol. Um, it is not usually the case. Usually we have a very good est uh, estimative of how much the vitamin D how much effect vitamin D will 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 have based on the initial stint of the treatment? That should be. I mean, there's no point of doing analysis in terms of PTH less than three four months into the the, the protocol because they will not be meaningful. Um, it takes the so, body that much that long to acclimate to the vitamin D. Yeah, are you at the minimum? I aim for three months after starting the vitamin D to be on the safe side four months. Um, so that's when my second, uh, usually the, the, the second appointment uh, happens. Um, but yeah, so it is a, a patient by patient situation. What we know is that usually on the second stint, so the second semester of the protocol, the third semester, the body can start deactivating vitamin D. Like we have a lot of vitamin D going around. Um, so we activate an enzyme that starts destroying it. So that's why um, we may need further adjustments down the road rather than just usual adjustments in the beginning of the treatment. Um, I cannot say that if 100,000 units drops you from 50 to 30, that if you go uh, 100,000 units more, it will drop from 30 to 10. Um, that's maybe the case. It, it needs to be the you know, doctor to, to evaluate this and, and make sure it makes the right adjustment. It also goes down to the calciums, how they are, uh, the overall stress on the, the treatment. I do pay a lot of attention to, the, I would say, the feeling that the patient has in regard to increasing the vitamin D. Um, we may go slower, we may go faster. It depends on the person that, that I have in front of me. You know, you brought up an interesting point there. We got about 50,000 questions that we can answer, but you brought up a question that is common. And that is, well, I feel this way. Hence, I need to do something. And what I tell people typically is you need to wait because the body yeah. may feel that way because it's adjusting to the, uh, uh, you know, what you've just done. You may have increased your vitamin D, decreased it, or it might just be time, um, you know, but don't, the protocol is not based upon how we feel. That's what I tell people all the time, because to be honest, there were a lot of days that if I was going by how I felt when I was getting better, I would have quit. You know, yeah. I felt terrible. I mean, uh, there, I felt tired. You know, I mm -hmm. if, to say to me, go over there to the television set and get the remote was the same as saying, run 25 miles and then we'll talk. That's the way it felt. Yeah. There were days I was so tired. I would rather sit in a chair and defecate on myself than go to the bathroom. That's how tired I was. Now, I didn't do that, but I'm just saying that mm -hmm. uh, that's the feeling that you have. So I tell people somewhat you can base decisions on feelings, but that's not 
the protocol. The protocol is not how I'm feeling today. Your your how you're feeling that day could be affected by sleep, stress, yes. weather. There are many other factors that can cause you to feel a certain way. But what we need to do is we need to listen to our doctor's instructions and maintain what he has told us to do. We don't need to jump around based upon how we're feeling. Is that correct? Would you agree with that? Yeah, it is, it is very much correct, even though um, there's always a balance between how people are feeling and what are they feeling uh, if we need to, I mean, what, what you brought up is, is a very interesting point. Uh, you basi were basically saying, I'm not feeling good yet. So therefore, I just, I, this is not working. Uh, and right. I will start to make adjustments um, on a daily basis or on a weekly basis uh, because I'm not good or I'm not feeling as good as I want. Um, yes. So it may be, I, I, I must be, be, I must make changes in order to, to, to get somewhere. It's not, and, it's normal and natural for people to want to feel good. I know what that's like. You have a day of almost a euphoric feeling. And then the next week, you you can barely get out of bed. Yeah. So, so people that, want to go back to that feeling, and they feel like something is wrong. And it's yeah. Not. I mean, um, and in that those types of feelings, those types of, of situations, indeed, there's from a, from a technical standpoint, from a, a protocol point of view, you have to give time. It doesn't work from one day to the other. The, 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 the quickest I've seen the protocol work, I think it was four weeks and it was one, one patient, but I have also a patient that took two years to feel significant yes. improvements. Yes. So um, on average, people start feeling the good effects of protocol around, um, around six to eight months after starting. Wow. Doesn't mean that you may not feel better uh, sooner but you should not expect. And that's the real problem uh, around expectations and setting a, a expectations too yes. high or too fast. Um, yes. I've seen one of the most incredible cases that I've seen was, uh, well, I, I will not go into a lot of details, but basically when she, when she came into the, she had disease, multiple sclerosis for, I think around seven years, five years, sorry, five years. And when she came in, first appointment, she could only walk 100 meters. Hmm. Second appointment, she could only walk 150 meters. Bear wow. in mind, it is a 50% improvement, but still it was 150 meters. After one year, she could walk 200 meters. Still, she was improving. Fatigue was much better. It is a significant improvement and anyone that only walks a hundred meters. When she when can walk to hundred meters, we are talking doubling. It's a significant, and we should cherish and value and uh, and and yeah, we should um, be very grateful to be able to go better. Typically, However, oh, let me just uh, the, the, what happens in the second year of treatment was mind blowing. She basically could walk 25 kilometers, which would be around 16 miles, 70 miles, I think, uh, without any limitation. So she could go on the hikes with friends without any problem. But that's just because she waited two years. If she could, if after six months, she would say, well, I, I'm just improving 50 meters. Huh, this is not for me. I'm." The protocol doesn't work. Right. She will never get to walk again 25 kilometers or 16 miles, I guess. So that is one 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 part of the feeling is am I expecting too much too fast or not? Should I be more patient and wait for it to to go? It may never go, but it may. 
So that's one, one part of the story. The other part is if you are feeling bad and if you're having um, any a side effect that may not be because of the calcium and vitamin D of toxicity, but anything related, I've, I've seen a lot of uh, cases, even GI changes, sleep changes. And in that case, we may tweak the treatment in order to account for it. And we may change it from week to week to, to go for a smoother transition and a smooth, uh, smoother um, increment of vitamin D and not go full on so fast. So that is a very small part. And I do uh, change my treatment some cases, very rarely, but some cases on, on a weekly basis, just to make sure that we titrate the best. But in terms of aiming for the results that people so desperately want, sometimes we just need to, 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 to we, we need to wait. That's basically it, we need to yes. wait. You know, uh, one of the greatest pieces of advice I got when I started, I was about six months along, and I think I can use her name, Yara Wanderlust, who you probably know is the head of the Mexican um, Facebook group. Yara has recovered rather nicely from MS. I want to say she's probably done the protocol 10 to 12 years. And I wrote her and I felt terrible. I felt like I was dying and Yara and I had felt those euphoric days where I felt wonderful and I wanted to go back and I thought maybe I was doing something wrong. Yara gave me one of the best pieces of advice that I've ever had being on the protocol. She said, patience, patience, patience. And when you run out of patience, go out and find some more. And I have told people that hundreds of times, and it's hard. I had somebody a week ago that began to weep. And uh, this person does not weep, does not cry. I've never seen this person cry ever. Uh, they've always been upbeat, but they started to talk to me and they began to weep. And I said, that's normal because you feel good it's the roller coaster. You feel good. You're up on the top, waving your hands, and then all of a sudden you go down, and it's not so fun. Yeah, and, and that's so it's not that's abnormal. So yeah, yeah. It, it, you know, on my part, I've told people, I wish I could give you a pill or tell you something to do, but all I'm going to tell you to do is wait, and probably I would guess ninety nine percent of the time they have contacted me back and um, you need a crowbar to get the smile off their face because they are so happy and feel so good and uh, you just you want to hug them uh, because you know that feeling I know that feeling um, what they're going through but when they're going through it there is nothing nothing I could say or do to make their life easier. You're just going to have to go through it. You know, it's like Sir Winston Churchill said, you just got to uh, never, never, never give up. That's what he said one time giving a speech. And um, that's the way you have to be. You have to, you have to just go through it. I wish I had something to tell you. And maybe you can interject something. Well, um, yeah, I, I, there's, there's nothing that will um, substitute um, time. And usually people when start protocol, they are on the second, third, fifth, tenth year of disease. So we just cannot expect significant changes in a couple of weeks, a couple of months, um, when something took years to develop. That is, uh, I wish it was not like that. I wish I could speed the process. I, I, I wish I could promise uh, my patients, well, don't worry, everything will be all right. Um, what I can say is what I've seen. And bear in mind, I've, I've seen things 
that if it was not my own eyes and my own hand writing records, I would not believe if it was my best friend that was telling me, oh, a patient of mine recover like this. Well, really? But yeah, so I've seen miracles happen. They don't happen to everyone. No. They don't have an unfortunately they, they, no. And a small improvement is an improvement. I have a patient that could not sign letters, and he can sign letters now. It is an improvement. No matter how much we want to, well, but is doing this is like uh, yeah, it's not a hundred percent improvement, but it's not getting worse. Is getting stronger, is getting better health, and is getting better from something that's not supposed to get better. You know, I want to tell you something that really surprised me. I think that I was probably PPMS because of how long it took for my disease to stop and for my progression to stop. Um, and from reading what Dr. Coimbra has said, about PPMS taking a little longer. That's what I think in my case. Okay, so I was at about two years and six months, I'll say, and I knew my disease stopped. People may ask me, how do you know? You, you didn't get an MRI or anything. You know, you just know. You just, you feel better and you start seeing things improve. Well, at about three years, might even have been a little bit past three years my mind and my speaking came back. And not that they were bad, don't get me wrong. I could speak and I could think before that, but my mind became very crisp and my speaking, my, I even had a, um, a speech pathologist watch me one day and she said, you're speaking a lot better. And I said, I've noticed that because when I started, it was like I'd been drinking bourbon. I was slurring my words and I would, I didn't like the way I, I talked and I called a lady in Denmark and I said, I don't like the way I sound. And she said, oh no, you sound perfectly normal. She said, you sound very diplomatic is the word she used. And I said, no, I don't know the diplomats you know, but they've been drinking and they sound like me because I sounded like I'd been drinking bourbon. I mean, uh, I was slurring my speech and uh, I didn't, I was talking slow. I couldn't remember. And, uh, but at three years, my speech became very crisp and my mind was very sharp and I knew it. I, uh, my wife, you could see it, you know, my wife could see it. And, um, you know, that all just came back and, uh, you know, people, I, of course, we get the questions millions of times, and I don't know, millions, but people want to know, well, what am I going to get back? When you initially go in to be diagnosed, they tell you that MS, once you lose a function, you don't get it back. That's typically how it, when it start, when the disease starts to progress, you don't get a function back. So I think people go on the protocol and they think, well, I'm gonna be normal. No, you're gonna stop your disease. We don't guarantee you're gonna get any function back, none. If you do, that's great. I have, I, I've got- we, can, we cannot even promise that the disease will stop. Right. Most people have the right. disease stop. Right. But it's not 100%, not close-ish, close but it's not 100%. So, um, what we try to do is to stop the disease and create the conditions so the body can recover what it can recover, what it may recover. It can be 2%, it can be 98% the recovery. Both should not happen. No one should improve to 2% on MS. Right. So both. Right are success cases. However, they are mo very different. If you recover 2%, you're basically the same. 
if you recover 98%, you get your life back. But they both mean the same. And it's important for people to, to understand. I know that you understand it. Uh, but it's important to, to know that success in this treatment or any treatment for that matter is not getting 100% back. It is getting something back. Not getting worse, getting stronger, getting something back. That is success. Yeah. So 2%, 50%, 19%, they are they all mean the same from a Greenberg protocol perspective. However, I fully understand that from a person perspective or a patient perspective, mean they mean very different things. They mean that I'm I'm not as good as I hoped, or I'm better than I hope I would ever be. It depends on expectations, it depends on on. Uh, yeah, it depends on a lot of different stuff. I was interviewing a Coimbra patient who's gotten back most of her life, Denise Meadows. Denise was saying, I wish that I felt this way 20 years ago. And I was telling a patient or a person a couple of months ago, she was saying, uh, well, when am I going to start feeling good? Because I feel fantastic. And I said, can you walk to the refrigerator and get a soda out? She said, yes. I said, I can't, but I feel wonderful. I said, now, what do you want? You want to be able to go get a soda or do you want to feel wonderful? She said, well, I guess I'm going to have to be patient and wait. And I said, that's what I'm telling you. Now she is doing wonderfully. She not only feels wonderful, she can still walk to the soda and walk to the refrigerator and get a soda. Um, I feel wonderful. I feel better than I felt 20 years ago. And have I gotten everything back now? But uh, my eyes come open in the morning and I can't wait to tell somebody about this because um, it'll change your life. I mean, it changed my life. Even though uh, I might have disabilities or lost some things, that is predictable and understandable because I had the disease for 15 years. I think my disease was probably PPMS or SPMS. We don't know for sure. Um, and uh, because of that, I often tell people what affects getting bad things back is one, has your disease stopped? Two, how long have you had the disease? Where are your lesions located and what type of disease do you have? So, you know, people often watch videos of people that have relapsing remitting. And uh, basically, whenever the disease isn't active, they leave a fairly normal life. And I, I did too. But go on, then they go on the protocol and, you know, basically they don't have any more relapses and their life continues on. Yeah. For some people who are in a wheelchair and have the, have the disease for 20 years, I often tell them, I'm not going to guarantee you ever walk again. You probably won't, but I can't say that. I've seen people, you know, get up and out, but that's really rare. Um, so we make it no is. predictions about recovery. But here's the thing that you address there. Any recovery is better than what you were told when you were initially diagnosed because they tell you your only hope is a slow progression, you know? And um, within a year and a half, I was in a wheelchair. And so my disease had already started to progress. And um, so I often tell people, I wanna scare you. If you're up walking around now, I want you to do this because I don't ever want you to lose any functions. You know, if you have all your faculties and all your functions now, fantastic, keep it that way. But don't wait until you go into the wheelchair to try this because it works and try it now while you still have all your faculties and functions, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's, that's very true. And I think it's a wonderful way to to finish the today's episode um all right 
I hope that people found this explanation uh, helpful. And as we said last time, please submit your questions. So next week we can address them. Um, as, as we also discussed, we cannot give, or I cannot give the direct medical advice. I can only speak in general terms. If you have specific questions, please contact, contact your doctors. Um, now, if people want to contact you and, and use you as a protocol okay. doctor, how do they do that? Yeah, so you, the easiest way is either go on my, uh, all right. Is it stopped? Let me just.